Hi everybody, welcome back once again to another episode of Indie Book Club. And in case you can't tell, it's Halloween. It's not Halloween. It's obviously not Halloween. It's not 4th of July either. It's after 4th of July, even though I'm filming this before 4th of July. So we're all over the place in this episode. But in any case, we are going to talk about our Indie Book Club book for July, which is, in any case, um, very fitting with this whole situation. Uh, we are talking about the political thriller Monumental Encounter by Barbie Kinnison. We begin in Afghanistan, possibly present day, not really sure. The book was written in 2020. We begin in Afghanistan, where elite SEAL Max Lakota Paxton and his team are tasked with destroying a new, young, and unpredictable player who has picked up where the Taliban left off. He's got money, firepower, and plenty of support from the old guard, and has set his sights on revenge. Things do not go well for Paxton, and when he and his team return to the States, they learn that the threat has moved to American soil. But tracking and defeating the young radical is nothing compared to what they discover next an insidious conspiracy with roots in the heart of the American presidency. Whoa, that's a lot. So Barbie Kinnison uh, contacted me through the Henderson Writers Group. Um, she currently lives in Wyoming, is what the back of the book says. And as I said, it's written in 2020, so we can assume that she lives there uh, now. Um, but she used to live in Las Vegas. So between the Henderson Writers Group and the Las Vegas Connection, um, that's how I'm calling her a Vegas own writer, even though she's not here anymore, but it's okay. So for that alone, this would be worth reading. It was for me. Um, but if that's not enough for you, uh, there are a few other reasons why you might like it. Number one, unique hero. It's not unusual to have, you know, a native American as a hero. Um, I haven't seen a native American army or in this case a seal member i be a hero of a, of a book i could be underread in this genre i know i'm i'm in fact underread in this genre i don't read a ton of political thrillers but it does seem to be the realm of mostly white men uh being the heroes in books like this from from the limited uh exposure i've had um so to see a native american seal not only in the book but as the main hero uh, struck me as very unique. He is Catholic um, or of a Christian faith and also of a Native American faith. So she does this thing where he marries the two together. If it was just Native American, you might call them supernatural visions, but it's sort of alluded to that it is in fact God, the Christian God delivering this stuff. So it's a little interesting how the two things kind of overlap because it looks a lot like you might expect more um, of nature visions happening, but he attributes them to the more Christian um, monolithic God. So it's kind of interesting how his character does that. Number two, a unique villain. I was in high school in, in uh, 2001. Um, I remember very clearly the day that uh, the, the towers fell, 9-11. As, as you might recall the day. And I remember afterwards, you know, there was a lot of reactionary material that went um, in counter to that, as, as you might expect with a national tragedy. A lot of it was pretty one-dimensional when it came to the bad guys. They are bad and the heroes, which were typically Americans and they're... Now, what Monumental Encounter does is it actually takes whole sections and focuses on the bad guy. It's in his head or um, it's third person, so it's close third. And it allows you, at least in some sense, to gather an understanding of why he's doing what he's doing. He's in Afghanistan well after the Taliban is destroyed. Like I said, I think it's meant to be more or less present day or within the last five years at least. He is, you know, distraught, he's upset, he's upset with Americans, he's upset that this uh, cause that he, for, you know, he believed in. Um, I don't totally make the leap as to why, you know, he believed in it, why it was a good thing. It's a bridge too far, probably. There's a saying, and I forget exactly what it is, but basically it comes down to the fact that a 
book's success hinges on its villain and how unique the villain is and how compelling the villain is. And in this case, I don't think there's been a whole lot of books that I've read anyway um, that try to not necessarily justify a terrorist motivations, but at least try to illustrate them. And what Kinnison does is she takes them and she puts them out there and says, here's why he's doing it. And it sort of is left there for you to either say, okay, well, that's still awful, but at least it's logical, or to just reject um, a whole cloth, uh, which is commendable. Number three, that's some great irony. That quote is actually from Clerks, the animated series, which I think maybe four people on the planet have seen, including Kevin Smith. Man, it's cold in here, like that planet Hoth in Empire. You've already made that Star Wars reference. So when I'm talking about this, I'm referring specifically to two scenes in the book and how they relate to each other. Um, the first one is kind of near the beginning. Uh, the SEAL team is still in Afghanistan. They're hunting down Al-Wali, who's the um, young uh, Taliban, kind of, even though the Taliban's gone. He's the young um, radical uh, who's kind of picked up where they left off. And he uh, found all of their gold and all of their money, and he is building a resistance kind of... Um, certainly a, a response to what has happened in his country. There's a scene where he's gathered all of his uh, followers, his acolytes, um, the people who are in support of his message, and they're, they're in this big building, and they're talking to each other, and they're having this conversation. It's one of those conversations that definitely feels like it was out of that retaliatory 9-11 um, response. It feels very uh, one-dimensional, and talking about, you know, oh, we love to subjugate women, we hate the West, you know, very sort of stereotyped kind of conversation. The plot goes on from there. Things happen, um, things transpire, things kind of fall apart. The team gets back to America, and there's another scene where they are talking with the president and the joint chiefs or the cabinet, um, way high up in the American presidency. They're debriefing and they're talking about, oh, what should we do next? So this is from the first scene, the one um, in Afghanistan among the generals. One commander wanted to impress the others on his astute awareness of the world and his ability to read. He brought in old news clipping from 2010 showing what Iran's leader at the time had said. We are right in our ways and what we do in the Muslim Brotherhood because the supreme guide, Mohammed Badi of Iran said long ago that the US is an infidel nation that does not promote morals or human values, and they are not fit to lead humanity. He said America and Israel are Muslims' real enemies, and waging jihad against both of these infidels is a commandment of Allah that cannot be disregarded. He said all Muslims seek to satisfy Allah, and this can only be done by raising a jihadi generation that pursues death just as the enemies pursue life. The others in the room clapped and cheered as they agreed they were the chosen ones, and how they lived was correct. So yeah, not super flattering for uh, those generals. Definitely portrayed as the bad guys. Just through the record, the portrayal of the main bad guy, Al-Wali, is um, not quite that uh, narrow-minded or, or old-fashioned, I guess we might say. His narcissism actually helps him in that way. It's like, I'm smarter than those idiots. Um, and we're, we're the re as the reader, you're like, yeah, I mean, good. You know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that, even though you're still trying to, you know, murder Americans and kill America, um, at least you're not that. It's a little weird. So this is about 50 or so pages later when we're in the office of the president with uh, Homeland Security and all of this. The president has just asked for solutions. Um, I want discussion plans and decisive implementation starting to be made right now. He sat and awaited their responses and comments which started coming in and making good sense. I'm not gonna read it all because it's a couple of pages, but um, I'll just read some of the stuff that I found interesting. So from the Director of Homeland Security first. Their activities in mosques need to be monitored because they are using some of them as underground training centers for terrorism and our politically correct dunderheads are ignoring it for the sake of furthering their campaigns and their hopeful reelections. It nauseates me to think that's all they care about. Sink America, but get me elected mentality. 
I think it's imperative that we follow up on solid leads, get rid of unconstitutional no-go zones within our own nation, and get rid of the welfare system that supports the illegal thieves while stealing money from honest, hardworking Americans. Um, and the rest of it is a lot about uh, the welfare system, um, how we should abolish it because it is um, basically harboring terrorists or allowing terrorists to harbor in the country, um, and no-go zones which uh, don't actually exist in America. And I think my favorite one, the one that um, really kind of just pulls it all together is, uh, is by the Department of Defense uh, guy, who says, those who happily follow this new leader, referencing uh, Awali, the bad guy, those who happily follow this new leader for their own power surges are gullible fools. They chant their mantra, death to America, as if hypnotized. And they're laughing at our stupidity for ignoring their threats. So that quote, if you remove death to America, I mean, it sounds a lot like the people in that room. I mean, you could make the argument that Kinnison is, you know, just hates terrorists and is um, super, you know, pro all of those things, pro, like, not pro, anti-welfare um, and, you know, anti-no-go uh, zones, which again, aren't real, um, which she might be, but given how the book ends the trajectory it takes um, to the point where spoilers it ends up that the people surrounding the president are part of a, a human trafficking child trafficking ring it, it seems like a subtle irony that is kind of drawing a line between the terrorists and the american government maybe i'm reading too much into it i don't know I really enjoyed it. Um, it made me smile. So whether or not it was intentional, uh, I can't say, and honestly, I don't really wanna know. I don't wanna know um, because it would ruin it for me. So I don't tell me if I'm wrong. I just, I just wanna enjoy that. For the writer's takeaway this month, uh, as you know, this book, Monumental Encounter, is a political thriller um, and the stakes you know, in this book could not be higher. We are talking about a terrorist who has found his way into America and is gonna do something awful. We are talking about life and death. We are talking about the soul of a nation. That is heavy stuff. And yet there are times when it just feels sort of like, okay, that happened. Why? We, we talk about a book having stakes. When you're a writer, one of the things that, you know, every teacher, every critique group member, every agent pounds in your head is like, what are the stakes? What are the stakes? Why do I care? If you have them, you should be good, right? But um, in this case, there were some, some issues. It, it wasn't as exciting as it should have been for life and death situations. In exploring that problem, this month's takeaway is the case of the thrillless thriller which is a little bit of an overstatement. There were thrills in here. Um, that just That's just a more catchy title than saying the sometimes thrill is thriller. So the first issue, um, the lesser issue of the two, I think, uh, in my opinion, is that a lot of the thrilling stuff, the stuff that would be most exciting, is given away in the summary. We're told in the very first line after recovering from the shock of a terrorist attack on an American FOB in Afghanistan, which is literally the first about 100 pages. Like that line just gave away the first 100 pages or so of the plot. And it's a big shock. It's a big deal when that happens. Um, they're this elite SEAL team and they got, you know, caught unawares and everything fell apart, you know? And to give it away that quickly, um, kind of undercuts uh, a good chunk of the story. The second problem, and probably the bigger one because it proliferates throughout more of the book, is that every conflict, almost, that comes up after that first one, the approach is basically the same. It's, we see an issue, we plan a solution, we execute that plan, it goes fine, we go home, we regroup, 
we figure out the next problem, bop, 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 bop. It's that way every single time. And, you know, I mean, you could excuse it by saying, well, they're an elite force. You know, they're really good at their job. Of course, they're going to plan it to perfection. They're going to execute it flawlessly and everything's going to go off without a hitch. And maybe in real life that would fly, but in books, it's just boring. You know, like reading about someone who's perfect and never makes mistakes and never encounters problems. It's boring. It's like, it's like saying I had to go take my car in to the shop and I took it to the shop and they said, you need an oil change. And I said, okay, how much is that going to be? And they said, it's $25. And I said, that's no problem at all. And I paid with a credit card and the charge went through and I took my car home. Like if you were listening to that story during dinner, you would want to smack that person upside the head. Cause it's like, why did you waste my time <laughs> telling me that story? What's more interesting is if you say, I went to get my oil changed today, but the garage was closed. The one that I normally go to was closed. So I had to drive across town. And while I was doing that, I ran out of gas. So then I had to call my cousin, but he wasn't home. So I had to walk to this gas station that was five miles away. And when I got there, there was this creepy old dude playing the banjo outside and he looked at me really funny. So I started running and he started chasing me. And you know, you can see where that's a much more interesting story than just, I went and got my oil changed and there was no problems. I would like to say just for the record that um, actually reading this book was, I don't want it to sound like I'm dogging it too much. Um, I think it's a legit critique, um, but for me personally, it really helped me identify places where I've actively had this exact issue. I, I'm thinking of a very specific book I wrote. And the problem is, as I'm thinking about it, is she has a problem. She comes up with a plan. She executes the plan. Nothing goes wrong. You know, there are no obstacles. And that is, I think, the key takeaway from this book. There were there were exciting scenes in this book. Um, there is a showdown on uh, Mount Rushmore that's very, very fun. There's an interrogation scene that is uh, quite good. Um, so I don't want it to sound like this book is just, you know, absolutely nothing's happening. It's just when you think of a political thriller, you expect those twists, you expect those turns of fate. Um, you expect things to go wrong and the heroes, because they're so good, to be able to overcome them. So I'm gonna revise what I said uh, in previous episodes about this. You need stakes, stakes are incredibly important. The stakes need to be life and death for the main character. That doesn't mean they actually have to be under threat of death the whole time. It just means that if they were to fail, their life is going to change significantly for the negative. Um, so it could be that they're gonna lose out on a romantic possibility or they're gonna lose a job or any number of things. It really depends on your genre, what's appropriate for the stakes in that one. For political thriller, life and death, uh, destruction of a nation, things like that, uh, destruction of um, federal property or, or any kind of property in a, in a major way, a, cat a catastrophic incident of some sort, um, that makes sense. As important as stakes are the obstacles. You have to throw rocks at your at your heroes. Your, your villains or nature or just circumstance have to be throwing things in your hero's way to stop them from you know reaching the goal or preventing the tragedy. If they don't, is it really even a story at that point? You know? It's just kind of like a thing that happened. So that's the takeaway for this month is introduce obstacles to your heroes because though they may be good, your villains have to be as good. And that is how you avoid having a case of the semi thrillless thriller. Thank you once again for joining me on this Stars and Stripes holiday themed indie book club for the month of July. 
Um, if you're interested in political thrillers, go ahead and pick up Monumental Encounter by Barbie Kinison. Uh, another, you know, Vegas adjacent uh, author. It's got some interesting stuff in here and um, some, some stuff that made me chuckle a little bit. So maybe it'll make you chuckle too. Next month, the month of August, we will be talking about the urban fantasy book, Eyes of the Grave by Chelsea Callahan. Unlike this one, uh, which I loved, but don't really have a whole lot of background to talk about it. Sorry. Um, this one's right in my wheelhouse, so. Uh, should hopefully have some more uh, useful insight. If you're here with us on YouTube, please go ahead and click the subscribe button, click the like button if that is appropriate for your feelings right now. If you wanna see more from us in between videos, you can go follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We've got our Medium publication, which is theuglycatpress.com. And if you want this kind of content coming to you straight to your inbox, if you go to our Facebook page, you can sign up for our email list, which will make things infinitely easier on you because you'll just get an alert right away in your email when there's a new video um, and some other cool stuff. I hope you had a great 4th of July slash will have a great 4th of July and we will see you in August. America!